is Dr. Daniel Martin Arran, Chief Scientific Officer and one of the co-founders at Chronomics. Today, I have the pleasure to be here with Dr. William Seeds. Dr. Seeds is a board-certified surgeon practicing medicine for over 25 years. He's also the founder and chairman of the Seeds Scientific Research and Performance Mastermind, founder of the International Peptide Society, faculty developer and lecturer of the A4M Peptide Certification Program and leading peptide therapy researcher. He is also the Chief of Surgery and Orthopedic Residency Site Director for University Hospital Geneva in the US. And he is also a professional medical consultant for the NFL, NBA, and NBC's Dancing with the Stars, among others. I almost need to catch my breath after that, go to seats. Uh, welcome, uh, thanks so much for, for being here today. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you, Danny. Always good to talk with you. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Um, so Dr. Seeds, uh, among everything, he's also a world leader in peptide therapy and what he calls cellular medicine. So I think that's going to be a bit of the discussion that we're going to be having here today. For those practitioners that might be listening to us and don't really know uh, what peptide therapy is, could you maybe give us a quick intro to it? Sure. Well, it's, so peptide therapy is really, you know, first of all, peptides are signaling agents that are familiar to the body. We have over 7,000 peptide signaling agents in the body. There are basically amino acids that are combined together with peptide bonds, and they can be three, two amino acid sequences. They can be 50 amino acid sequences. It just it just depends on the signaling agent, where it is, the brain, uh, the heart, the liver, the kidney, uh, muscle. It just depends on you know where it is and what its function is, and that's kind of what the makeup of that peptide signaling. Now, it can be a hormone, it can be an enzyme, it can be a ligand, it can be a receptor. So they play many roles, and basically. Um, these are, from our standpoint, these are precision-oriented endogenous signaling agents that we can, we can mimic and approach medicine in a totally different way of where we can be more proactive in working on the cellular level in correcting or augmenting the efficiency of the cell and bringing back that metabolic flexibility of the cell that enables it to make all those inherent decisions it, it needs to function in a you know homeostatic uh, pattern and that that's really what what peptides are all about that is that is certainly fascinating um, so obviously at chronomics we we focus a lot on epigenetics and epigenetic testing. So what is, what is the connection between uh, peptide therapy and, and you know, epigenetic testing? And how do you, as a, as a cellular medicine doctor, really view the, the epigenome? Uh, is, that, is that a target maybe for, um, for these peptide therapies? If we, if we measure the epigenome, are we going to be able to maybe quantify improvements through, through these therapies? That's the crux of... I, I think where all of this is so fascinating and so exciting with what you've done at Chronomics and, the, and what you and your team has been able to establish with setting up these, the algorithms and the data where we can actually look at these true markers um, that respect and, and, and represent biological age how we react to exercise, you know, the environment as far as smoking and stress and nutrition. I mean, those are all the things, you know, number one, nutrition and exercise are the two biggest um, peptide producers that are positive for the body. I mean, these are, this is where we're all trying to mimic to some degree what exercise and nutrition does. And we're just, as, as you know, in the, in the world today, we're just not very good at exercise and nutrition, we're all working to get better at. But the focus on the epigenetics is that with, with peptides, you know, we're really focused at, we, obviously we cannot change the genome, but 
we know that there are all these epigenetic forces on the genome that are trying to constantly change that transcription and translation of proteins and enzymes and so forth that are being made uh, secondary to reacting to these stressors of life, be it viral, bacterial, environmental, radiation, nutrition, you know, over-exercise, doing too much, stress. So, you know, we know those things play a role in changing the epigenome that affects the phenotype of the cell. So by looking at these markers that you guys have done so brilliantly, and I have to say, you know, with this, uh, with the uh, type of sequencing you do and looking at 20 million markers, I mean, that, that type, that amount of data just is, uh, is incredible in my mind. And, and so when we can look at that much data and look at how peptides influence, because, because ultimately what we're doing in cellular medicine, it's all about controlling redox in the cell to control the environment and basically to keep that cell efficient. And if redox goes the wrong way, redox eventually can affect all of these factors that change the environment, that change uh, the specific things that can affect DNA and histones, and they can change methylation markers. And that is, that's kind of the easiest way for us to look upstream at the potential of incredible changes that we know we're making today with peptides, how we're changing immune disease, inflammatory disease, um, neurodegenerative disease. All of these things are, are tough right now in, our, in, in the field of, um, continued in the field of re regenerative medicine because the markers are also indirect. You know, they're indirect markers, basically, or you're looking at one factor or a couple. Well, here you've got 20 million markers that we can look at, 20 million genes that we can look at different methylation markers to assess the improvements that we're making in, depending on where people are in their state of health, of what we can do to influence on the cellular level these changes. and. And that is, that's the future of medicine. That is the future for all of us because right now we don't have that. And that's what's so exciting uh, being in this, in, on the forefront of this field where, where we can actually start doing some significant validating of the, of the things we're already doing clinically. And uh, working with, uh, with, with you guys, Danny, and, and your team has just been fantastic. And, and the, I think the synergy is there where we're going to be able to really make some changes and validating some, si some significant aspects of, 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 that are direct and continue to be followed. We can follow these as, as you have so well renamed uh, the chronomics testing as the genomic twin of, of whomever we're evaluating. You know, this is the way of the future where you can con constantly go back to where you start and all of that data is relevant all the way through. So it's exciting for me and uh, I'm sure I made that pretty long winded, but there, there's, <laughs> there, there's so much to it um, that you can unpack that. We could spend, you and I, Danny, could spend two days talking about this, right? That's, that's probably true. That's probably true, Dr. Seitz. <laughs> yeah, so you mentioned um, a, few, a few diseases and, you know, how peptide therapy uh, can be useful for them. But let's, let's not forget about the risk factors for, for those diseases. And to many of them, the aging process itself um, is, is a, core, a core risk factor. And of course, you know, over time, we've realized that the epigenome is a really good place to look at in terms of quantifying, uh, you know, how we're aging at the cellular level, at the molecular level. Uh, and therefore, that could also potentially, I guess, open um, the room to, to validate in the context of, of anti-aging interventions, uh, potentially some of, some of these peptide therapies. So I guess, uh, you know, what, what makes you different 
uh, in, in terms of how you view aging, I guess, from, from the medical community? Well, I, I think it's, I, it's not that I'm different. It's just that I believe my, I have a depth of knowledge that, that is more significant in looking at now all of these things that, um, for me, it's been a passion for 35 years of knowing how the cell functions and more in particular, what makes a cell efficient. And it, it's just fascinating how all of these disease processes and aging all come down to the same story. It's about controlling the thermodynamic nucleotide cofactors in the cell like NAD over NADH, NADP over NADPH, ATP, you know, AT, ADP over ATP, acetyl-CoA over acetyl. Those are really these cofactors that control the redox of a cell. And it's all about oxidation and it's all about reduction. And understanding that is the beginning of understanding aging and cell senescence and where that takes the cell. And it's no different in the heart, it's no different in the kidney, it's no different in the muscle, in the brain. And that's what's so fascinating. There is a, it's a, if you understand the basics of the cell, you can go anywhere in these, all these silos of medicine to see how significant that, that understanding is in understanding everything uh, relative to disease. And it's, it's all about, you know, in, in a nutshell, it's about the cell losing efficiency, not utilizing the flexibility of substrates like amino acids and carbohydrates and proteins at, in, as its ability to adjust to adaptive stresses and the eventual production of pre-senescent, senescent cells that then have an effect on where, specifically where that's happening could be in the brain, could be in the kidney, in the muscle, or in the uh, pancreas. And you start to see the relative changes in cytokines and chemokines and proteases that affect the environment of the cell. And we have precision-oriented, directed peptides that can, we can work on immune function, we can work on cell efficiency, we can work on improved autophagy, mitophagy. We can work on, um, on improving the um, specific aspects of the immune system acting as the best synolytic you have um, to all, it, to work together, not individually, but like an orchestra in taking care of issues to correct problems, but to also, you know, bring that cell back to a state of efficiency. And I'm not talking about, you know, when I talk about aging, my goal with aging isn't, I'm not looking for the fountain of youth that of keeping people alive, you know, 50 more years. I'm looking at making the years that you have relative to what your genome is set up to do. I want those to be the most productive. I want those, to, I want you to be able to function at a high level. And that's, I think what we're, what we're accomplishing on the same side of that. We're having significant effects on disease processes, like immune diseases, inflammatory diseases, metabolic diseases. And it's, again, it's so relative to the cellular metabolism and, Understanding that, I, I think that um, that understanding that, then that makes so much sense why this epigenomic, epigenomic information is so valuable when we have now ways that we're actually going into a cell and adjusting this epigenome because the epigenome is reversible. And we have now you know, we, we have a way to measure this that I think that's incredible. And, um, I think, you know, you've already seen, look at what, look at what Horvath has done with just 
with seven patients and next array sequencing, which was probably 400 to 800,000 uh, markers they looked at maybe, or it maybe wasn't even that many, but just the fact that they were able to show with growth hormone exogenously and DHEA and metformin, they showed D, a, a actual reverse of the biological clock. Now, granted that the, the, the inception cohort is, is a little off, but it's still, it's a valuable study showing that we can affect the epigenome in a positive way. And with peptides, everything's endogenous. We're just letting the cells do what they can. We're letting them produce their endogenous growth hormone or working on endogenous IGF-1 production or uh, regulating interleukin-1 beta production, which is a pro-inflammatory agent, or controlling nuclear cap, nuclear cap factor uh, B you know, that transcribes some of these pro-inflammatory agents and controlling the inflammasome and upregulating the stem cell. I mean, these are such valuable tools at this point to have to start changing some lives. And, and that's what we've been doing. And it's, it's, I, you know, it's a movement that can't be stopped because things are, are really happening. And this is what makes it so exciting in, in all the work that you guys have done and, and moving forward. Uh, in looking at these uh, at these markers, absolutely, and I think um, in terms of how how we actually have a real impact in in a positive way, as you said, in in the health of um, of our societies and and our patients. Um, for those practitioners that are new to to epigenetics, what would be the the first things that you recommend in order to see improved patient outcomes? Well, I, you know, always from my side of it, I'm, I'm a zealot for exercise and nutrition. I mean, you, I, I don't think there's any, there, it's going to be in the, there's no, there is, I think it's going to be up. I, I think the data uh, will always back up what exercise can do in influencing um, the efficiency of the cell, the flexibility of the cell, and actually having the effects just as calorie restriction is shown um, in, in diet that we can actually reverse the biological, we, we can change the biological clock. And um, I think that those two factors, again, like I said, nutrition and exercise are always the key. But with with these uh, peptide signaling agents, uh, we have some powerful ways of of augmenting or working in concert with uh, exercise and, and diet to really make something move to the next level. And in fact, as as we know, as your nutritionists and your trainers and everybody out there understands with exercise and nutrition. Sometimes we can't get that started. But when we have these peptides where we can work with people and, and let's say we're trying to work on, on endogenous growth hormone production, IGF-1 production in a person in their 50s, it's lost their, it's getting a little brain fog or post-COVID or where they have some real issues with uh, uh, some of the neuropeptides that, uh, that are under still an inflammatory state yet they don't realize it. Um, Let's say we can all of a sudden change that in a week or two weeks. We can give them back. We can turn the switch back on. Those moments when you can capture a patient and they're endogenously changing, bringing back their executive function, bringing back, taking them out of brain fog, um, things like that, capture a patient, and then you've got, the, you've got the conversation you've been looking for because they want to know, well, what else can I do? Um, you know, and then you have the conversation about diet. You have the conversation about exercise. And they become your best advocates of all of those. Because, because once that happens, I rarely see someone go the other way. And, and to have the data like you have in being able to predict the outcomes based on algorithms to show people where they can go 
I mean, you, you're instead of talking about a lab test, you're showing them something that is something that doesn't go out, doesn't, they don't lose that picture in their mind. And that's a valuable tool for a clinician uh, to, to be able to, to, to let them, because we're not the best at communicating these things to our patients all the time. And when you ha have a tool like that, they, they understand very quickly, you've got a lot of really good things happening at that time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you hit right on the spot of, uh, you know, we have all this uh, incredible tools to, uh, you know, affect our, our physiology and, and our health, whether they are like more, I guess, traditional interventions with exercise, diet, as you mentioned, but also, you know, drugs and, and peptides. And, you know, the fact that now, you know, we, we can start to collect all this molecular data, all this objective data about whether they are working or not for that particular patient. Uh, that is really what, what makes the difference, right? And I think you, you mentioned before, we had this conversation quite a few times about uh, building the, your digital twin and the idea behind how important it is to have this, this objective molecular markers. And I think, uh, you know, uh, our, um, the people listening, listening to us, our practitioners will be uh, really glad to hear that now they can, they can augment, uh, you know, the different types of, of therapies and, and things that they can do uh, in order to, to improve uh, the health of, of their patients. Um, so I guess in, in those regards, uh, for, for these practitioners, how, you know, how can they get involved? How can, if, if they're interested in, uh, you know, learning more about peptide therapy and, and, you know, the possibilities that it has and how it relates to, uh, you know, the epigenome and, and quantifying this, how, how do they get involved? Well, so I, I, there's a couple avenues. So I actually am, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to be spearheading the, pretty much the education around the world with, uh, with the, the, the use of peptides, but more importantly, the cell and the molecular aspects of why we're doing this and, and what the cell requires uh, to, to become efficient and to maintain its flexibility. And I've just, I've just finished, uh, I've completed the, the first uh, book in the world on, um, on uh, peptides, a, a basic introduction, volume one. Uh, and we have the, Seed Scientific uh, Research and Performance, the SSRP, is a, a large uh, group of physicians around the world that I train. Um, and we, are, we meet uh, every quarter. Um, and we, we do things live, but also stream our video of live streaming where people can be involved with some of the, some of the docs I've been teaching for the last three or four years that are people that speak for me again, all over the world also. Um, and because we just keep, the education doesn't stop. And as you know, uh, Daniel, um, we can't know enough, right? There, it, once we think we've got all the knowledge, we know there's just so much more uh, that, that's just the tip of where we are. And it's just so fascinating to see where we've gone uh, with this and, and to have, we have a forum where people can share their patient stories. It's the most advanced, I believe form in the world uh, for clinicians to be involved, and um, that's the feedback we get. And, and I'm I'm humbled by by all of that 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 we're able to do this because the bottom line is we're all looking for improving our outcomes for patients, just as you are looking for improving the life of of the people you touch with your testing. It's just this this synergy I see with all of this is. Uh, is really the formula that's move, that's going to move forward and change the world. I see it as we know and look at medicine today. Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, you summarize it there very nicely. The combination between uh, neo personalized therapies and objective uh, ways to, to quantify their success at the molecular level is really what's gonna what's gonna make this happen. This revolution in in medicine and, and preventative healthcare. Uh, so thanks so much, Dr. Seeds, for, for the conversation today. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always, uh, to have you here. Uh, and I hope uh, we can hear much more about uh, this, all these projects on, on peptide therapy uh, and all the things that, that you're doing 
uh, in the future. So I hope uh, also that many of the practitioners uh, that have uh, listened to to this video uh, get in touch with you uh, through that way that, that you mentioned and uh, we can keep the conversation going. That's great, Daniel. I, I really appreciate that. And I want, I want people to know that we've made the information accessible to everybody to understand. Because as you know, if we're not good at what we do, if we're not good at expressing information where people can understand it and assimilate it and, and put it together productively, we're not good at what we do. And, and so I think that's, I think that's where this marriage is really amazing also, because you've taken a complex, complex problem or, or assessment of data, and you've made it into a beautifully simple way for everybody to understand. And that's something that, we're, that we work very hard for in the SSRP and putting data and information together that's useful for doctors and clinicians and healthcare providers and nutritionists and trainers where it makes sense to them. And, and that's, that's what I think, I really think that's a, the, the key to this whole thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Seeds, and uh, speak to you soon. All right, great to talk to you, Daniel.